the hill. So we talked a lot about Torah. I realized that I, I sort of assumed that you guys knew all this and I sort of ran through it, um, at least the, the concepts. So you should do the concepts more and then explain them. Okay. So let's see now where we pretty much... I'm sorry. We're halfway through the 48 on the, on the left. But the Bible says that the Bible so now we want, we said that Yaakov represents the balance, not just the balance, but machriya means that it contains both aspects, the left and the right, the loving kindness and the might. And this is where we see that the heart has the ability in a mature person to have some kind of carrying of opposites. Meaning that on the, on the one hand he's in the middle of din, could be a judge, in the middle of a, of, a, of a trial, and he has to give a verdict. On the other hand, at the same time, he's still, his heart is still filled with mercy. So even though he's doing, if he's not really judging, so that's a different problem. But here we're talking about somebody who really is judging, who really is Yoshev al he's really uh, sitting with the, with the law and, and making sure that he understands everything perfectly and it's all well defined. And yet, at the same time, he has the ability to have mercy and compassion, to have loving kindness. On the, so he's combining the left and the right together at the same time. That's what it means that you're a tiferet, that you're able to combine the two at the same time. It's like to have nesiyat afachim, to be able to carry opposites. The in the world of rectification, there are few lights, and the vessels are many. So the vessel is wide enough to receive two different types of light. This is called it kalelut. It's called a, a, an interinclusion between two. It's not the highest level of connection, but interinclusion is very high, up on the levels of uh, combining two things together. So in Hebrew you say that the person has a wide breadth of his consciousness. You say, Da'at Rechava. Da'at Rechava is like somebody who is mature enough so that he can hold both sides of the argument at the same time. And they can dwell together at the same time in his mind and in his heart. On the one hand, there's reason to be lenient, but even though on the other hand, that there's also a reason to be strict in this case. The whole point of Tikkun, the whole difference between Yaakov and Esav, is that Yaakov represents a world of Tikkun, rectification, and in rectification, there's the ability to combine the two things together. Now, again, this is called itkalalut, inter-inclusion. That's what these three lines represent. So the, the, there's an ability to take the left and the right and to inter-include them within the middle. Here the point was, Yaakov has already achieved rectification. So now he wants the higher lights, the lights that previously when they came into vessels, they broke them. Meaning the consciousness that existed in the, in the world of, uh, of Tohu, in the world, the primordial world of chaos as it were. It was too strong. The lighter was too strong for the vessels to contain it. And we said that the best example for this is, is a child who's growing up, who's maturing, and he begins to see, he, be he begins to come in contact with the very strong lights, the very strong energy, ideas, um, actions that are done in the, in the adult world. And right away he has a problem because he can't contain it. He can't use it properly. He doesn't know how to how to be able to uh, to uh, to uh, to contain 
what he's seeing and what he's hearing. Right? So he so he's in a conflict because he doesn't have yet an ability to contain Period. to inter include both. He, he he becomes very very what we call uh, angry. And the anger comes because there's no ability to contain, and it, and in the extreme cases, it leads to a mental breakdown. Imamish can lead to shattering of the vessels. Now, the truth is that every person goes through this every day, because the beginning of the day is usually chaotic. <laughs> and you have to have a wide dot in order to contain it. And then, as, you, as, you, as, as the day continues on, you sort of settle down and everything becomes easier. So, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a small uh, in a small way, we all go through it all the time. But really, what goes on in a person's life is there are always phases in life, and there are phases in which these chaotic lights they come down. Every makif, in this sense, is comes from the world of chaos, as far as we're concerned, because it's not contained yet in anything that we have, especially when it's the type of thing that came from Asa. But Again, I said, Ace of Hira, he's, an ex he's, a, he's a unique exemplar. There was nobody like him afterwards. There was no particular person in the non-Jewish world that you could go to and say, oh, if we are able to make peace with him, then everything will change. Even though there were people who thought this, uh, Rabbi Abraham Abu Lafia, for instance, he went to the Pope and he thought that he would convert him and, and uh, that would work, and, and all yeah, kinds well. of ideas. But in the end, none of these ideas mean anything because it would just kill the Pope or throw him out. He would have lost all, all, all this clout, or whatever, whatever ability he had to uh, influence people. So, so every time you go through this process, for instance, when a person is uh, ill or feeling ill, so in that sense, what's happening is that he's receiving lights that are too big for the vessels. And he has to find a way to contain it. He has to find a way to integrate it into his life. Once he's integrated it, the effect of the chaos that it brought onto him is diminished. And slowly, as the light becomes integrated into his life and becomes inter-included, everything comes back to balance. Okay, so Yaakov's point here, or his purpose, was to take the maki from, from Esav. Shubchinata or the to shublik vul. And these are, again, lights that have no no limits. Let, let me give another example of something that was like this in the Kedusha. Um, every time that there was a, uh, a, a, an important development in, in Torah, initially it came out as something chaotic. In, in, the, in the initial stages, it was overwhelming to all the, all the lights that already existed. Say it another way. I'll give two examples of these. One of them is, um, is, is the Mishnah that we learned last week. So we saw that the Mishnah was suddenly a new book that came out of nowhere. It's not tied back to the, to the Chumash, at least not openly. And in a certain sense, this was a mapicha, it was like a revolution in Jewish thought. And to have this, and, and it's very, very difficult, what do you do with this? So it had to be somebody of the stature of Rebbe, of Rabbi Udana Si, who could do this, otherwise everything would have been broken, it would have been shattered. Like he himself was holy enough that people trusted him to some degree that what he's doing is right. But right when that happened, there was a tremendous break from certain parts of the of, of Yiddishkeit. Like the Karaites left, and they said, this is not true, it's this, it's, it's overwhelming. What are, you, what are you doing here? It's not just, be, I mean, I think they understood that there's tremendous holiness in this. But the, their vessels We're ready weren't, ready, weren't able to contain this. So in the end, we don't give up entirely on Jews. Like, even if a Jew is overwhelmed, said, oh, so take your time, and uh, we'll meet you back uh, again in a few, a few miles down the road. But in principle, a lot of people are not able to, to, to uh, contain these, uh, these tremendous lights that come out. The same thing happened with the Baal Shem Tov, when the Baal Shem Tov came on the scene. So suddenly, he taught a whole new understanding of Yiddishkeit. And it was shattering for a lot of people. They're like, they can't handle this. What's going on? So again, the the only thing that you can really do is you can put him in is, 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 <laughs> no, is, <laughs> is you can give him benefit of the doubt if again I have no storage. I've done everything I can, and I can't. 
you know, buy another phone. Um, um, so the only thing you can do, like with Rebbe, is to, is to trust his holiness. And by holiness we mean that he himself is able to contain the light. And there was a, there, there was a, the Baal Shem Tov did a lot to, to demonstrate that he was not being overwhelmed by what he was teaching, that it was not uh, shattering his vessels, meaning, in other words, that Yiddishkeit continued, halacha continued exactly the way it was. He continued to daven the same way, he continued to daven better. And, and a lot of times the Rebbe used to give this, uh, this argument that we see that as much as Hasidus is new light, and obviously it's coming from a place that wasn't integrated before, as much as it, it is new light, it did not affect and only strengthened the level of observance of those people who went uh, by it. Meaning that you saw that the connection to and the, and the commitment to, to the nigla of Torah remained exactly the same and even better. You know, the Rebbe a lot of times says that in the end you see the Hasidim are more strict than, uh, than, than most other people. Okay, in any case, so th- th- this thing happens a lot. Anytime you bring something that n- new down, in that sense, it's, it's new light, and it's, it's, it, it's hard to integrate it. And it creates a revolution in the person's thought, and there's a period of, of un, unbalanced uh, life. And things are like, uh, are very... Unsettled. Uh, kind of unsettled. So Yaakov, he wants to do this, and that's why it's called Bligvun, that it has no limits yet, because it hasn't been put into, into a vessel. And so we said that he gave up on Esav giving him this, meaning Esav was not going to join him. They were not going to become one happy family. So now it's up to Yaakov to bring this chaotic light down by himself. So how do you do this? You have to, we talked a little bit about this, you have to do some awakening from below. Maim Nukvin, feminine waters. The order in the world is that anything that you want to bring down from above, you have to do something from below. Nobody owes you anything. And even if you do something, nobody owes you anything. But Hashem set up the world in such a way, it's a principle called Avodat Tzorech Gavua, or Lemaseh Adai Anitzarich. Hashem could have built the world any way He wanted. He chose to build a world in which the awakening from below resonates and creates an awakening from above. That's called, I need the work, my, the, the work of my hands, meaning I, I need my handcraft. Hashem doesn't need us, but He built the world, He created the world in such a way that it looks as if He does. So there's this relationship, and it's not just it looks like it. Again, He could have done it any other way. But when he set it up this way, it becomes an intrinsic part of the relationship between Hashem and the world. Meaning, Hashem's putting himself on the line for it, as it were. He's, he's taking a risk. And he's saying, I will be or not be in the world depending on what the people do. And depending on whether they, they want me to come down or they don't want me to come down. I'm not going to come down. Of course, everything is Hashem. Everything is... But will the presence be known? Will Hashem's presence be revealed? Will you see um, an advance in how much we understand Torah and all this? It all depends on how we awaken from below. So the classic example in every day that, w- that we live our lives is that you wake up in the morning and immediately you go down. And why do you immediately go down? Because that's the awakening from below. And that sets up the rest of the day. That sets up the, everything that you get during the, the day itself. So if you don't dive in, in the middle, in the beginning of the day, there's no maim nukvin, there's no feminine waters. And if there's no feminine waters coming from above, there's nothing greeting them from below. Now what does it mean to have feminine waters? It used to be it was just to say it. But one of the, one of the big chidushim of the Baal Shanta was that really for something to come down from above, you also have to make yourself into a vessel. I Meaning you have to create vessels. You have to create something that will contain what's coming down. So really, Hashem is awakened, not just by the fact that you're awakened, by the, but by the beauty of how you're awakening. Meaning, what are you doing in order to, as it were, and the word, there's no other word, it's a word that the Zohar uses, and it's a very strong word. It's to, in a sense... Entice. Entice him. Thank you. I was going to use a different word. Yes. This one's better. Thank you. I knew you were. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so I want to entice him. How do I entice him? I build a beautiful vessel, and this he wants to come into. This he's willing to come into. That's what it means, that, that the purpose of, of creation was to create a dwelling place below. And he created a dwelling place below by making it comfortable, by making it beautiful. So every person's life, every person's um, conduct, the way that he acts with other people and so on, is all a vessel that he's creating in order to bring Hashem down. Now we know how this vessel looks. We have a Shulchan Aruch, and we have Gemara, and we have Hasidus, and we have a lot of things that tell us how to build it. But in this case, when Yaakov is going for something that has never been brought down before, there's no Shulchan Aruch for it. And this, this has to be known, that one of the great things that the Tzaddikim did in the previous generation, they still do today, is that every time that you want to create a new reality, you have to awaken in a new way. You have to find something new. So we have this, it's one way of saying this is that it's a skula. Okay? And skula means that, there's one famous story that uh, I don't remember who it was, and he was also you know, Rabbi Shua Bells that we talked about before. Horton. Horton. Who? Name is Shalom. This is Shalom. Shalom. Shalom is something else. There was a break in the middle, and then, and then uh, Bells started. Rabbi Shua Bells was the first, uh, the first group rabbi there. In any case, the English for Shua is Portland. What is it? It's just like Portland. It's like is it, is it, how do you spell it? P O R T N T N. Yeah. Sound like a potion? No, it's Portland. It's Portland. Like, you, you know what I'm talking about? Well, he's a chemist. He's got to know what you're talking about. It's got something to do with chemistry. That's what it sounds like. I have no idea. It's probably yeah. from alchemy in some way. It's got to come from alchemy. If we're already saying that, I have to throw out my uh, two cents for the last month. Yeah. <laughs> my chiddush for the last two months is that psychology had, th- had until now two stages. Stages of thought. I'm talking about uh, th- what they're doing now is not thought. It's just a brute force. Again, because nobody knows anything. But, um, but the first stage was Freud. And he decided mythology would teach us about the human psyche. The second stage, which is much less well known, but is very, very strong, is Jung. And what Jung did, he used alchemy. And the benefit of alchemy, the, the, the reason it's much better than mythology is that it's much more current. It's far more current and it's much closer to what we do, because we live in a world that's very technical. And so to use alchemy is like to, dis- to discover how a person projects his psyche onto processes. Mythology was pure psyche. There was no process. There was no, no, nothing going on. The third stage is going to be when they discover the Hasidus is the best uh, source. The Midrash is the best source for uh, for understanding the human psyche. That, that's up to us. In any case, okay. So, <laughs> so getting back to this, so you have to have some portent. And what's a portent? So every tzaddik he would look for something that had not yet been done to entice Hashem to come down. Okay. So it's a famous story that that after a while, you can't use the same portent. I mean, you could. You could use the same skula, but it's not as enticing. I've seen, I've been there, I've done, I've done that, says Hashem. Let's see something new. <laughs> figure something new that you can serve me with. And if you can figure something new, oh, this I want to see. Imagid used to give a muscle for this. He used to say that when it comes to Maim Nukvin, the, the most important part of Maim Nukvin is how innovative it is. So he says, for instance, innovative, not just that it's new, but that it's surprising. It's something that I, I wouldn't think of even, could even exist. So the example the Magad used to give was that kings very much enjoyed when uh, people would come from distant lands and bring them a bird that can speak. Ah, speaking bird, that's already, that's already uh, this I haven't seen. So he says, actually, when a, when a, when a person davens, he's nothing more than that, <laughs> in a certain sense. He's like a, he's like a bird who's speaking. How could matter suddenly say these words? Where did this come from? It's very enticing. So davening always gets Hashem. But Tzaddikim always looked for something more. He said, what, what else can I do? So that's why many of the Hasidic stories are about somebody doing an extraordinary act. Like, for instance, uh, somebody giving all his money suddenly to Tzedakah. And uh, because not all his everything.